Yes, and I can't, uh, yes, it's a little foggy. It's a little foggy, but I, 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 can, I can see you. And you look great. You look, you look wonderful. Uh, one of the things you'll, you'll notice right away is, um, well, as the cases of, of COVID increases, and when this sort of moves from an abstract something that's going on out there to people that we know and love, are dying or are very sick. I just want to reassure you as your pastor that I am taking this very seriously and I take your health and safety very seriously. And um, I know that right up here, you know, we've got a lot of wonderful people who are in very close proximity to one another that are very passionate about music ministry and um, you know, their responsibility for leading all of us in worship Sunday after Sunday. And some of the folks are understandably a little anxious. So I've been doing, in, in addition to all the other things that I do through the week, um, which, and, and actually playing golf is not one of them. Um, I'm, I'm one of those rare pastors that doesn't do that. Uh, so I have time to do other things like uh, research uh, COVID safety precautions. And so, uh, so we have introduced these face shields for, uh, for our choir and for myself, and we'll just do this as, uh, as long as we can. Um, we're trying to space out the chairs up here, if there's an empty chair, then, then we try to take that out and give folks uh, a little bit more space. And one of the things that consistently in all of the articles that I read, ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. Uh, is one of the things that just keep the keep the fresh air moving and circulating is one of the things that helps to minimize the spread of this terrible disease uh, as much as possible. So as long as the weather will cooperate with us and just be thankful we're not in Indiana or Michigan or somewhere like that where many of you have come from, we can keep the doors open as long as it doesn't get too hot. So uh, so that's that's the reason. This is. It's not, you know, this is not neglect. We didn't just, we didn't forget to close the doors. Um, we're, we're trying to do this to, to keep you as safe as possible. You know, I told the choir this morning, I do not want to spend Christmas this year sitting at home in front of the television watching church. And so we're going to be doing everything that we possibly can to continue to be able to meet in person and worship uh, in person uh, as long as long as we can. If at any time there's something that we're doing or we're not doing that doesn't make you feel safe, you let me know, and we'll we'll try to we'll try to address that uh, as best we can. So I'm glad that you're here, and I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, but just a reminder, and I'm not asking anybody to move. However, <laughs> we've counted. We looked through the camera up there. Anything behind this set, I like the hat by the way too, that's very cool. Anything behind this seventh row, people can't see on Facebook. And of course what we can see here is about three fourths of the congregation is sitting behind this seventh row. So Facebook watchers, just so you know, three fourths of the congregation are behind this seventh row. But if you ever do feel the urge to move up, that would be great. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning. Most of them were, they were all scrolling on the screen prior to the, to the service. The Boys and Girls Club, uh, who we have partnered with and support since 1998, have asked us if we would do a little toy drive uh, for their children. So the slide was up there just if you're out at Walmart or Marshalls or somewhere shopping and you just want to pick up a new unwrapped toy, we've got uh, trash bins. Uh, located uh, by the doors, and you can just drop that in for the next uh, for the next couple of weeks. So whatever you bring uh, would be uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, I think the only other do I need to make any announcement about the decorating, Nancy? No, you got it all in hand. Great. <laughs> it says on the sign. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. It's, I think it's like five to twelve or, or, or something like that. But it, it says on it says on on the bin. Um, and then the last thing I would say is I know that many, many of you know and love uh, Patsy and Cesar uh, Martinez. And I just want to give you a, a very brief uh, update. Cesar texted me this morning, and I tell you, this face shield and can I wear my glasses and uh, trying to do all that is uh, going to be a challenge. So stick with me. 
spoke to Caesar says spoke with Patsy's nurse. She is stable on BiPAP, but at 35%. MRI test today. Pray for good results. Unfortunately, her COVID-19 test still shows positive. Keep praying for this disease to leave her body and for the Lord's healing to continue. Love all the continued prayers for our, for our Patsy, Caesar, and family. And I sent that up uh, the update. I sent out updates to a variety of, of people in the church. And uh, Hannah uh, Tucker actually texted me back, and she said, "You know, when my dad, uh, you, you may know uh, her dad, Fred Tucker, when Fred was so sick with COVID, one of the hardest things was not having that personal contact, not being able to see the faces and hear the voices of your loved ones." So. She has her phone with her this morning and a little tripod, and we're going to make a little short uh, 30, 40 second video. So if you are interested in sending uh, a message uh, of love and your good wishes and prayers to, to Patsy, just see uh, Hannah after the service and she'll capture a little video clip of the event. She's going to put it together and we're going to send it to Caesar. Somehow we're going to figure out how to get it to her in the hospital. So I think that's all the announcements I had. A uh, very warm welcome to Mr. Lowell Mills, uh, who is uh, our organist, and uh, Tina, who is uh, with us uh, during this time. And uh, what are we doing next? <laughs> All right, I think it's time for the prelude. Uh, over to you.
Sunday, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his words with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Father God, you have given us so much for which to be thankful, and our hearts are very glad indeed on this Thanksgiving Sunday. For all your kindness to us, and to all people, we give you praise on this day. Lord, we are also very conscious this holiday weekend that there will be many, many people traveling. Some of those people will be traveling disregarding the risk of spreading this terrible disease that afflicts our nation and our world right now. There will be some who will be very keenly aware of the risk, but just feel that the pull for his family and loved ones is too strong. But Lord, I just pray that you would keep us safe during this time. Lord, may we live our thanks in all that we do. We pray that you would give us faith and wisdom and patience and godliness and humility and an extra measure of grace, that we might live together in the spirit of love. We pray all of this in the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, let's join together as we sing, Come, ye thankful people, come. Take you a little while. 
how to learn your way around. <laughs> Sorry? Is a valve stuff up there? Yes. It's what? It's the four foot octave. The four foot octave? Let's join in confessing our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> And so I take this opportunity to remind you that we provide as many ways as possible uh, for you to give. Uh, we have collection boxes both in the back of the sanctuary and up here at the front as you leave if you didn't catch it coming in. Also, you can give online. You can give by using the Church Center app, which many of you have on your phone. Or we like the good old-fashioned snail mail or just drop it by the office as well. So however you choose to give. Uh, we thank you uh, for that. Lord, we have expressed our gratitude with our songs, and we have thanked you in our prayers. We pray now that you would receive the gratitude of our gifts and bless all of those gifts that come in throughout the coming week. And prepare us to thank you through our service. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is one of those Sundays when it all happens. Everything converges, uh, including two-foot and four-foot vowels. Uh, it's Thanksgiving Sunday, uh, as the last Sunday before the official beginning of the Advent season. It is Christ the King Sunday, where we stop to acknowledge and proclaim Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so now, at this time, our second hymn reflects that. As we sing Charles Wesley's great hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Let's stand as we sing. Mm -hmm.
first Sebring family, Pastor David here, and I am excited to introduce our Advent and Christmas theme for this year, Almost Christmas, a Wesleyan Advent experience. First of all, it's Wesleyan, in which you'll be invited to have John and Charles Wesley, their life, teachings, and hymns help you in your preparations for Christmas this year. We'll travel through the four weeks of the Advent season, focusing on peace, hope, love, and joy. There's a devotional booklet available containing 31 daily devotions for December based on John Wesley's sermon, The Almost Christian, and hymns by Charles Wesley. You can purchase your own copy or access the material for free through our website. Our 24-7 prayer room will be decorated with lines from some of Charles Wesley's most memorable and powerful Christmas hymns to help focus our prayers and preparations. Finally, we'll be joining together in an all-together commitment through the Wesleyan Covenant Service. Almost Christmas is a deep spiritual dive into the active practice of waiting for Jesus to come. This is your opportunity to grow in your love for Jesus and others this Advent season. I hope you'll join us. Was that just me, or did that look like a foreign film that was badly dubbed? It didn't look like the words and the movements of my mouth were quite lining up. Uh, or maybe it's just this foggy uh, shield uh, that I <laughs> wear this morning. Well, in case you haven't picked up on it yet, I love Christmas. I love everything about Christmas. I love the baby in the manger, the wise men and shepherds, Santa Claus and reindeer, the lights, the decorations, the music, and the stories. We have this ginormous storage bin in our attic that is filled with just Christmas stories, just Christmas books. It takes two people to get it down. It is so heavy. And my favorite story, other than the original, of course, is Dr. Seuss's 1957 classic, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And in case you've been living in a cave for the past 63 years and don't know the story, the Grinch is a surly, antisocial green creature with a heart two sizes too small, who also lives in a cave atop Mount Crumpet, located above the village of Thuville. And he especially hates Christmas and has spent the last 53 years annoyed by the Who's Christmas celebrations. And in particular, he hates the noise, the gluttonous feasting, and the Christmas music. And so on Christmas Eve, he has finally had enough, and he decides to stop Christmas Day from coming by stealing it. In the end, of course, the Grinch has somewhat of an epiphany. We might even say he has a conversion experience. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, needs a little bit more. Now, we know before we even start reading that the Grinch has missed the whole point. We know that Christmas isn't about presents and checking off your wish list and getting everything you want. And despite what holiday retailers may want us to believe, Black Friday does not define our Christmas day. And yet, if we are perfectly honest with ourselves, at Christmas time, we often find that little bit more eluding us. As we go through December filled with a frenzy of gift buying and party planning and house cleaning and probably house sanitizing this year, and we go from one socially distanced gathering to another, we can see ourselves stepping back from all the madness and asking ourselves, isn't there more? Is that all? Is there a little bit more that should define our observance? Of the season. It won't surprise you if I tell you, yes, yes there is, yes there should be. There is a gift under the tree that you may have not noticed before, and your name is on it. But 
Notice it is not next to the to line. It's next to the from line. Because this gift is not for you, it is intended to come from you. It is not a gift for you to open, it is a gift for you to deliver. It is a gift for God. And it is the gift of yourself. It is the gift of your wholehearted, freely given commitment to God, allowing God to shape your life in the way that he wants to. So many of the main characters in the story of the birth of Jesus experienced exactly this. They were transformed not by what they got, not by what they received, but by what they gave up, what they surrendered. Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, gave up his confusion and his disbelief. Joseph gave up his fear and his conflicted feelings. Mary surrendered her whole self, body, mind, and heart. The shepherds gave their joyous praise to God. The wise men gave their most precious gifts to the baby and then chose to turn it away from Herod. The Christmas story, time and time again, is about the great lengths to which God went to draw near to us. And the joyous obedience to God that we are called to offer in return. So it's not about the gifts that we get. And it's not even about the gifts that we give. It's about the gift that we become. To God and to others. Now if all that sounds counterintuitive, if all that sounds countercultural to what the world wants us to believe about Christmas... And it should. Now, we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much because we come awfully close to getting it right. We practice goodwill and basically try to be decent toward other people. And that's good. We observe the basic practices of the Christian faith. Going to church, tuning in on Facebook, or listening on the radio, and remembering the Christmas story. And that's good too. And I really believe that deep down, most of us sincerely want to do our best for God. And good intentions are better than nothing. But if that's the sum total of our Christmas celebration, basic goodness, basic practices, basic sincerity, then John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, would have a word to describe our efforts. Almost. Wesley preached a sermon to his Oxford colleagues at the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin on the 25th of July, 1741, called the Almost Christian. And he took his text from Acts 26, where Paul is preaching to King Agrippa. And Paul gets done with his sermon. And then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, of course, this was the King James Version, the Bible of Wesley's day, the only translation to which Christians had easy access for hundreds of years. It would have been the same Bible, the same translation Philip Bliss had when he wrote his famous hymn in 1871, Almost Persuaded. Now, today, with more accurate translations from the original language, we know that Agrippa's response would be more correctly rendered. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? But almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian suited the message Wesley wanted to get across just fine. And so in the almost Christian, Wesley describes a person who on the surface had all the appearances, the, all the outward appearances of godliness. This person did all the basic things right. They practiced decency towards other people. They went to church, they abstained from bad behavior, and sincerely tried to do their best. But as commendable as that person might be, and wouldn't it be great if everyone was at least that good? He would only be an almost Christian. 
If all of these good things and more characterized our life, Wesley would stand before us today, hold a mirror to our souls, and say to us, Is that all? Isn't there a little bit more? And that's what he did on the 24th of, the 25th of July, 1741, to his Oxford colleagues. And you can imagine that a sermon like this to a church full of academics would go over like a lead balloon. And sure enough, it did. Wesley was allowed to preach once more in the university church three years later. And he chose the equally non-controversial topic of scriptural Christianity in which he criticized university staff and students for their spiritual apathy. For Wesley, that was the end of his connection with Oxford University. I preached, I suppose, the last time at St. Mary's, he wrote in his journal, be it so, I have fully delivered my soul. But as I said last week, I digress. In the Almost Christian, Wesley asks us, is that all you've got to give God? Doesn't God deserve a little bit more? Isn't it possible that God has given you his spirit and empowered you to do more than just the basics? Hasn't he called you to make an extraordinary impact for the kingdom? Doesn't God want nothing less than your whole heart? In that same sermon, Wesley calls followers of Jesus to be more than live an almost life. He calls them to live an altogether life. It's what Jesus called life in all of its fullness, the abundant life. One that, first of all, fully loves God. And here's how Wesley describes that love. Such love is this, as engrosses the whole heart, as fills the entire capacity for the soul, and employs the utmost extent of all its faculties. Lord, fill me with you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to the extent that there's not room for anything else. That's what it means to live an altogether life. That's what it means to be an altogether Christian. And secondly, he calls them to love others, including especially those who have wronged us and those who we have wronged. And thirdly, he calls them to have full trust and confidence in God. And don't we need that now more than ever? So that faith isn't just an intellectual exercise, but it offers, it moves us to offer our whole self, mind, body, spirit, and altogether Christian is one who unreservedly and wholeheartedly trusts God and then puts that trust into action. Now, <laughs> if all that seems a little overwhelming, then it should. If this seems like a much taller order than just preparing for Christmas, that's because it is. But the good news is, that is what Advent is for. Despite our urge to rush headlong to the manger and get to Christmas as soon as possible, these next four weeks of Advent are meant to recalibrate us from just living an almost kind of life toward an altogether commitment to Christ. Now, Wesley's sermon wasn't intended to be an Advent or a Christmas sermon. Of course, it wasn't. In fact, we don't have record that Wesley uh, ever observed Advent. And that was likely due to the impact and the influence of the 17th century Puritans that was still very much around in 18th century England. If you ever had to read, anyone ever have to read The Crucible in high school? Yeah. I am convinced the only reason that book is still in print is because of high school English teachers requiring their kids. It's awful. It's depressing. So, you remember the Puritans were a fanatical, joyless lot who saw Christmas as merely an appropriation of a pagan holiday. In fact, when they eventually, when they won the English Civil War and beheaded good King Charles in 1649, the first thing they did was outlaw Christmas. Humbug. Now we know from his journals that Wesley acknowledged Christmas and even preached sermons on Christmas Day, but we don't know that he ever observed the Advent season. 
But even though the almost Christian wasn't an Advent sermon, I believe that it can still be really helpful in our preparations for Christmas, especially in preparing to receive Christ more fully into our hearts and lives. So I want to invite you to consider the following questions drawn straight from this sermon as a way of asking how we can be a gift to God this Advent. Now, the really cool thing is that um, the Almost Christmas Advent Devotional is available to you with 31 daily devotions that include reflections on these 25 questions, plus six additional reflections based on Christmas hymns by Charles Wesley. So you'll begin on the 1st of December, and you'll read one each day until New Year's Eve. If you want one, let me know. We'll order them. We've got plenty of time to order them and get them in. You can order them for $12, or... Am I starting to sound like an infomercial? Or... Because of COVID, the United Methodist Publishing House and Adam and Press have allowed us, as you saw in the video, to make the contents of this little book available on our website absolutely free. So when you go to our website, firstsebring.org, you'll see right there at the top, almost Christmas, right at the top of the page. Now all they asked us to do is to make the page password protected. So the password, is between us here this morning, and everyone watching on Facebook, is Wesley, with a lowercase w. But don't worry, I'll send out a church-wide email this week with a link to the page and the password. So here are the questions, just, just to whet your appetite. One, do I so far practice justice, mercy, and truth as even the world requires? Two, do I even appear on the outside to be a Christian? Three, do I practice godly behavior? Four, do I refrain from doing evil things as described in the Bible? Five, do I do good with all my might? Six, do I seriously follow God's commandments whenever I can? Seven, do I do everything with a sincere plan and desire to please God in every way? Eight, am I at least observing the qualities of an almost Christian? Nine, Am I willing to go a step further to be an altogether Christian? 10. Is the love of God shed abroad in my heart? 11. Can I cry out my God and my all? 12. Do I desire nothing but God? 13. Am I happy in God? 14. Is my glory, my delight, and my source of joy God? 15. Is this commandment written in my heart that he who loves God loves others also? 16. Do I love my neighbor as myself? 17. Do I love everyone, even my enemies, even the enemies of God as my own soul? 18. Do I love others as Christ loved me? 19. Do I believe that Christ loved me and gave himself for me? 20. Do I have faith in Christ's blood? 21. Do I believe that Jesus has taken away my sins and cast them as a stone into the depths of the sea? 22. Do I believe that Jesus has blotted out the handwriting that was against me, taking it out of the way, nailing it to the cross? 23. Do I feel the assurance that I have been redeemed of my sins? 24. Do I feel the assurance of the Spirit that I am a child of God? And the last question based on Wesley's final instructions. Can I lift up my hands to heaven and declare to him who lives forever, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He ultimately, Wesley concludes his sermon with a paragraph that could very well summarize my hope for what this Advent, this season of being almost Christmas, might mean for you. Sorry, that's probably slightly irreverent, but I had to do something to lighten the atmosphere after all those heavy questions. <laughs> Talking about the Santa hat, of course, that's not part of the original painting. <laughs> in case you didn't realize that. <laughs> May we all of us experience what it is to be not almost only, but altogether Christians, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus, knowing that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God, and having the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost given unto us. 
And notice that first of all, he calls us to experience what an altogether commitment might look like. That's why the series is subtitled, A Wesleyan Advent Experience. Just last week, I was talking to someone who said, you know, modern Methodists, they seem to have a lot of knowledge, but not an awful lot of experience. It's my hope that you will make Advent this year more than just an intellectual acknowledgement of what this season means, or by simply treating these exercises, including the using the daily devotional or spending time in the prayer room, just another responsibility that Pastor David has asked you to check off and many others during this crazy, busy, hectic time. But to make this an experience requires making your spiritual growth a commitment and a priority. By fully focusing all of your faculties of body, mind, heart, and spirit, just as the great commandment requires us to do. Also, to help you experience all that God has for you this Advent, our 24-7 prayer room is going to be beautifully decorated with material from Charles Wesley's Christmas hymns. And we're going to provide this. There's only three slots each weekday. There'll be a window of time that you can choose, either morning, afternoon, or evening. And that way, we'll be able to sanitize in-between uses. There's a poster at the back of the sanctuary this morning where you can sign up. Weekdays, we'll keep it in the office. You can pop by and sign up, or you can just call Shannon for an available slot. Finally, notice the choice of language that Wesley uses in this last paragraph. Knowing that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God and having the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Peace, joy, hope, and love. Now, as I've said before, this isn't an Advent sermon, but it really highlights those four qualities that we most attribute to the Advent season. And fully living out these ideals can not only be marks of an altogether Christian, but my heartfelt prayer is that it will lead us to experience an altogether Christmas. So I want to invite you to stick with us for these next four weeks, and we'll explore each of these four words more fully. We will delve into Scripture. We will share stories, some from my own experience, some from the experience of others. We will tap into more of Wesley's thoughts and writings and include some of Charles Wesley's beautiful hymns. We've got some fantastic music lined up for the Advents. We've got harpists and trumpets and brass quintets, and it really is going to be an amazing Christmas. We're going to sing. I've gone back and found some of Charles Wesley's Christmas hymns that he published in 1745. By 1761, most of them were dropped from most hymnals. And so I've set them to music. And some of these hymns we're going to sing for the first time in over 250 years. And I hope that the words of these beautiful hymns will also enrich your Advent and Christmas preparations. We'll conclude with a covenant renewal, a hallmark of our Wesleyan faith, and a perfect way, as Wesley said, to lift up our hands to heaven and say, my Lord and my God. And I'm super excited to tell you that, that our friends from the Nazarene and the Wesleyan churches have already said they would love to join us for this special time of worship. And we'll do all of this, not in our own strength, not in our own power, but by the Holy Ghost given to us. And so welcome to Advent. Let's become the gift to God and to one another. And let's experience an all-together Christmas. Father God, again, we thank you for this special time. Again, as we prepare to step into this Thanksgiving week, we are mindful of all of your many, many blessings. Your family, your friends, your home. For our place in your church with all who have faithfully lived and died. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, as we begin to prepare our hearts for this Advent and Christmas season, it is our heartfelt prayer that this Advent and Christmas would be a Christmas like no other. It is definitely one 
that we will always remember. But Lord, I pray that we don't remember it for the bad things, or for the hard things, for the wrong reasons. But I pray that we would remember because we chose to use this time time filled with uncertainty and challenges, much like the time right before that first Christmas, to focus our attention on you and what it means to become a gift to you, just as you gave yourself to us and to the world that first Christmas. Lord, may we explore what it really and truly means to give ourselves back to you in joyful obedience and gratitude. And Lord, help us to reflect over these next four weeks about what it means to be an altogether, not an almost, but an altogether Christian. And finally, Lord, bring us to that altogether Christmas this year. And be with us as we step into 2021, making that altogether commitment to you. Lord, we love you and we bless you. We thank you for this time. We pray that something has been said, a word has been spoken, a prayer has been offered, a song has been sung, a smile has been shared that will change someone's life today, that will lift their spirits that we'll walk out of here this morning feeling burdens lifted, strength for the challenges that lie ahead, and that we'll be a little bit more like Jesus than we were when we came in. And Lord, we offer all of these prayers in the name of him who taught us that when we pray, we ought to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, we started with Thanksgiving. We have Christ the King in the middle. Today we'll finish that great Advent hymn by Charles Wesley that reminds us that Advent and Christmas is not just about celebrating Christ's first coming as a baby in Bethlehem, but it's about preparing our hearts and looking forward to that day when he will come again in glory. Would you stand as we sing? So, sounds like we need the organ repair man to pay us a visit this week. It's baffling. It's baffling. Is that is that organ humor? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's the baffling. Okay. I thought it might be. Can't hit when all else fails. <laughs> <laughs> and all else fails. Use the piano.
this this morning, or perhaps this is your first time. Uh, we used to be able to, uh, to to hug and to kiss and to shake hands and do all those wonderful things that we love to do here at First Seabrook, but COVID has changed all that, and so we have introduced a new practice by blessing one another with the grace. Now, if this is your first Sunday, you're allowed to look at the screen. For the rest of us, we have been saying this now for the past uh, uh, several months, uh, we all have this memorized. And so what we do is we turn to one another, and we look one another in the eyes, and with a smile on our face, we bless each other with the grace. And so now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.